Good afternoon. Welcome to the second part of my lecture on oral history, myth and Egyptian folklore. Uh, this section focuses on the distinction between myths, legends and folk tales. So before a discussion of Egypt's um, mythological past can be presented, a clear distinction between these three major categorizations of prose narrative, uh, so myth, legend and folktale must be made. Myths are quite simply sacred narrative set in a time before the present, so often before the creation of the world as we know it occurred. The word myth is derived from the Greek mythos, denoting word or story. Often enough, they are stories that are held to be true, told by the traditional elders of a particular culture about their own culture, uh, and speak of a very distant past. They offer explanations and recount activities surrounding the origin of the universe and all things living or animate lying within. Some also embody dogma and function as authoritative sources for theology and ritual. Myths can be interpreted on many different levels. They can be viewed from an evolutionary standpoint as necessary precursors to scientific development, or alternatively, they might be psychological metaphors revealing hidden spiritual truths. Many mythographers take a more anthropological uh, stance seeing them as projections of human dilemmas and drives relevant to a culture at any one particular time. Legends, on the other hand, are also prose narratives that belong to a long ago past, although unlike myth, they are set in remembered or historical time, presented as undisputable truth and are more secular than religious. So for example, um, Atlantis, uh, King Arthur, the Holy Grail, the Mary Celeste, Loch Ness, the Loch Ness Monster, and the Fountain of Youth. They often concern themselves with matters of dynastic succession, migration, war, and heroic quests, which might contain elements of truth, but are largely obscured by unverifiable aspects like uh, hidden treasure in the supernatural. Uh, they are not as dynamic as myths because they do not demand uncondi unconditional belief from readers who might only take parts of the legend to be true or historically accurate. The legend serves to develop relations between concrete, historic, or topographical fact and the unknown world of the supernatural, striving to convince us of an event as having occurred. And the last uh, class, which is folk tales, they're prose narratives of fictional content invented by individual people. They are more often than not communicated orally, have no religious or sacred content, and might concern themselves with magic, enchantment, monsters, and talking animals. No aspect of these stories carries or pretends to impersonate truth. Many cultures have established formulas with which they communicate them. Fairy tales, a subcategory of folk tales, commonly open with once upon a time and end with lived happily ever after. The folk tale serves to communicate morals or from a Jungian standpoint, bring together archetypal opposites and unveil unconscious psychological patterns that may be at the heart of psycho-spiritual development, which of course Jung called uh, individuation and Maslow self-actualization. Ancient Egypt uh, seems to provide us with the first instance of recorded folklore in the form of myth. These written records, deeply religious and funerary in nature, date back to Egypt's Old Kingdom and are known as the Pyramid Texts. All human societies have stories of creation interwoven into their mythologies. Most of these describe how the universe and everything around us came to be. The setting is usually a flood of considerable proportion. In ancient Egypt, creation myths surfaced before the complex relationships between pre-dynastic gods uh, like Osiris, Horus, Hathor, Seth and Knum evolved. The theogenies, which propagated the most powerful of these were that of Ptah at Memphis, Thoth at Hermopolis Magna, Atom at Heliopolis and Knum at Elephantine. All these myths imagine the beginning as having been born out of an endless stretch of primeval ocean called Nun, with the patron of each city seen as the divine auto-creator of the world. In the Memphite version, Ptah conceived all aspects of the universe in his heart and brought it into being by speaking his thoughts out aloud. The ancient Egyptians believed that the heart was the seat uh, not only of emotion but wisdom and thought as well. The power of creation inherent in thought manifesting as word uh, called Logos in the Biblical New Testament 
uh, was very important to ancient Egyptian mentality throughout the duration of their history. In the Heliopolitan version, we have Atom, which is the solar creator god, appearing from the watery chaos um, and spitting out, or in some versions he masturbated, air, personified as the god Shu, and Moisture, which is personified as the goddess Tefnut. In turn, Shu and Tefnut united to bear Geb and Nut, the earth and sky. From the union of these two came Osiris, Isis, Seth, and of course, Nephthys. Together, so these nine gods were known as the divine Aeneid of uh, Heliopolis. The Elephantine version states that uh, Knum created the gods and mortals on his potter's wheel. Alternatively, the creation myth of Hermopolis Magna asserts that the Isle of Flame arose from the primordial waters of chaos. Thoth placed the cosmic egg onto the earth, which hatched to reveal a solar orb that proceeded to climb to the mount of the heavens. A variant of this myth narrates that a lotus flower rose from the watery chaos and blossomed to reveal the sun god Reharakti. And of course, Reharakti is uh, Ra and Horus merged into one deity. These creation myths are all variants of the same concept, so the state of order as we know it being established out of chaos. Each one gained the ascendancy when its cult center became the focus uh, of Egypt's political and religious administration. So that brings us to the end of part two. Uh, join me in the next video as I speak about ancient Egyptian folklore. See you soon.